Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Carrie Brazel. I'm with the Office of Emergency Management, along with my colleagues with the Seattle Fire Department. We're going to go ahead and get started in just a few minutes, leaving some time for folks to arrive. Um, so to get prepared for tonight, we want to make sure that if you would like to turn on live captions and subtitles, please select the CC button in your video controls. To change the caption language, select settings, the gear icon, captions and subtitles, and choose the language, language that you want. We'll use the Q&A function tonight to input questions. We will either provide a private reply, or if relevant to the whole group, we will hold until the end and our presenter will respond to the question. Please feel free to input any questions you have throughout the presentation. We will be recording this session and we'll post it to our YouTube channel by early next week with captioning. If you registered for this session via our events calendar and provided an email, our provided or email when signing to the Teams meeting, we will email out the slides and the link to the recording next week. Please do register for future webinars in this series by going to the Office of Emergency Management event calendar at seattle.gov slash emergency. Thanks so much for your patience, really appreciate it. We're gonna go ahead and get started and I'm gonna hand it over to Captain Andy Collins with the Seattle Fire Department. He is our emergency preparedness officer. Take it away, Andy. Thank you, Carrie. It is a pleasure to be here tonight uh, to share with you um, the, the Seattle Fire Department's uh, plans in the event of an earthquake or for that matter any large-scale disaster response. Uh, Seattle Fire Department is a lead agency in these type of events uh, and, and our scope uh, encompasses both firefighting, search and rescue, and hazmat responses. Uh, my name is Andy Collins. I am a member of the Seattle Fire Department. I'm currently the captain of uh, emergency preparedness, uh, which means that this falls squarely in my lane. Uh, I oversee all of our um, all of our disaster planning, uh, any of our outside uh, uh, coordination with other agencies, uh, as well as um, uh, uh, navigating uh, grant processes and so forth. So some of the capabilities unique to this city uh, come through this office. So tonight, uh, these are the things I'd like to go over. Uh, I want to kind of give you a peek behind the curtain of uh, the City of Seattle uh, Fire Department's planning. Um, we have we have lots of plans, uh, and and we are prepared. Uh, now I will say, full disclosure, uh, the type of incident that we're talking about tonight is going to be unique, and uh, our best laid plans may take a little bit of creativity. Uh, but but have confidence. Uh, the plan that I share with you tonight is, is all is an all hazard, all encompassing. Uh, but we're going to go through that. So we'll start out. I'll, I'll give you just some overview of the department, some of the unique capabilities we have here in Seattle. Uh, we're going to talk about the different, uh, our disaster management plan uh, and, and what that looks like, the different levels of that. Um, I'm going to give you some details on what our res initial response um, actions are. Uh, you may not see us immediately, and some of tonight is intended to set that expectation for you as a community to know that uh, at the onset of a big event like this, we are going to be consumed with uh, wrapping our arms around this. Um, but but I'm going to I'm going to let you know what we are doing uh, immediately following an earthquake. Uh, and then we're going to um, talk uh, a little bit about what that looks like when our resources are depleted, but we still need help. And where do we turn? Who, who's coming to help us? 
Uh, and then at the end, we will close with um, just just touching on some ideas for you as the public to be prepared, uh, because that really is going to be key in a successful response. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. I do encourage you to put your questions in the chat. Uh, if, if there's things at the end that I can answer, I uh, would love to answer your questions. Um, so let's get started. So out of the gate, Seattle Fire Department, you can see what our vision is, but we want to be a national leader uh, in, in both responding to and preventing these type of emergencies. Uh, and, and one thing I want you to take away from this as you read the mission statement is the, the, that second sentence, we respond immediately when any member of our community needs help. Um, and, and that is the expectation that we set with you. We want you to have that expectation. But just a moment ago, I talked about managing expectations. And, and when we uh, find ourselves in a, a large magnitude earthquake or so forth, we may not be able to respond immediately uh, like, like um, you are accustomed to. And I just we just want you to know that. So this is the lens that we conduct ourselves, our business through, and, and you can uh, watch that through this presentation. All right, Seattle Fire Department, this is who we are. Uh, we roughly have uh, just over a thousand uniform members. Um, of that, there's uh, four different platoons. Uh, we, we run a 24 hour cycle or platoon shift, which means that we have members on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We are available all the time. For, to take your uh, to field your emergency calls through the 911 center. Um, of that thousand members, we are supported uh, through. You can see the breakdown of our chiefs, uh, our firefighters, so firefighter EMTs, uh, as well as our, our paramedics. Um, and we could not do this without our civilian support staff, of which there are approximately 100. Um, we talked about our rotating shift cycle. Uh, that's A, B, C, and D. Uh, so there is a method to our, our work um, shifts, uh, but but basically that dices into uh, 200 to 250 members on call uh, every day in the city. We operate out of 33 stations geographically located, uh, as you can see in the map right there. Uh, we have six battalions, but uh, as many of you may know, Battalion 3 is actually the administrative headquarters for our Medic 1 program. So for all intents and purposes tonight, I'll be referring to five battalions uh, and that you can uh, remember this, this map because as we get into what we call decentralized operations, this is how it's going to break down into those five uh, operating battalions. Uh, I mentioned our, our 911 call center, that's the fire alarm center, uh, staffed 24 hours a day with uh, uh, uniformed members. Uh, they, you can know that whoever's answering the phone on the other end of your 911 call is uh, is a seasoned member of the Seattle Fire Department. They have they have responded to 911 calls before emergencies. They've been assigned to engines and trucks, uh, so they have uh, just institutional knowledge and context of what your needs may entail and, and how to best um, address those. Uh, we we uh, have our own training division down in Southwest Seattle. Uh, that's where we uh, conduct both in-house training, but also train our own firefighters. We we run our own recruit schools, our own recruit classes uh, down there. Uh, and then a big part of what we do is fire prevention. Uh, for us, uh, if there is no fire, if the you know if we can minimize the number of emergencies, that's a win. Uh, and so that that is the uh, fire prevention division uh, encompasses the the fire inspections that we do for buildings, uh, uh, maintaining life safety systems. Uh, that it's uh, uh, sprinkler systems, fire alarm systems. So the, a big part of what we do, but not always in the uh, the forefront. And then our services division. Uh, that's that is uh, where we are able to provide all the logistics that are required, both for day to day operations, but then uh, in these large scale incidents, that's where the cash of equipment is going to be drawn from uh, when we need to surge operations and and uh, get more equipment. Uh, more materials, uh, go uh, uh, procure equipment and so forth to address the needs. So this is what our rolling stock looks like. Uh, out of those 33 stations, we operate 32 engines. You can see uh, a dozen ladder trucks, a handful of, of aid units and medic units. Uh, we have some unique uh, units as well. Uh, many of you on this call 
are probably familiar with Seattle's Health One system, a system that's pioneered here in the Northwest uh, to, to really uh, address the needs of, um, of individuals that may not need uh, the a trip to the ER. Uh, instead, they may need to get connected with a social worker or a resource in the community. Uh, so we operate uh, the Health One unit. Uh, we all ha also have two air units, uh, and in those we will talk about in a, um, an instant that I'll go into, but um, that allows us to on scene replenish our supply of, of air. We've got some uh, hose wagons. Uh, again, I will, I will give you an example in a moment on how these would come into play into a, in a large scale incident. Um, and then we also have a fleet of fire boats. Um, Seattle Fire Department uh, is not only land based, but we also respond throughout the Puget Sound uh, and in the region. So I'm going to go through a few set of slides that explain some of these special units because I think it's really important for you. Uh, this is your Seattle Fire Department, and, and I want to explain to you uh, some of the unique resources that we have here in the city that are also not not available, not only available to us, but as a regional asset as well. So quickly, we'll, we'll run through these. Our Rescue One unit, uh, these members uh, operate out of Station 14 in, in the Soto area, and these they are uh, amazing. Uh, this, this is a team of people that are highly trained in heavy rescue, uh, operating in trench environments, dive, rope rescue. Uh, it's also our dive team, uh, but these individuals are going to be the ones that are called upon on a day-to-day -day basis to respond to the type of uh, needs that we might see across the city during an earthquake. Uh, structural collapse, uh, they bring the tools, the lifting, the breaching, the breaking tools uh, to access patients and, and um, mitigate the situation. Our hazmat team uh, down here in Pioneer Square, uh, this is a, a quite a robust capability. Um, many departments will have a hazmat team, but, but few will have uh, the, the level of equipment and the capabilities that, that you have here in Seattle. Seaburn uh, detection, um, enhanced radiation, uh, they're able to partner with law enforcement for uh, drug analysis in, in, in some of their scenes and, and so forth. And there's a constant relationship uh, that, that is intact with some of those agencies you see there, the FBI, uh, Dep uh, Department of Health, um, the, the 10th CST, the civil support team down in Camp Murray. Um, so you, uh, trust me, you're in good hands with, with Seattle Fire's hazmat team. Uh, a dedicated decon team uh, is here in Seattle. Now, this is this is for, um, I will say you, but the citizens. Um, in the event there's an exposure, uh, we're not just gonna knock it off with a, a fire hose. We're gonna run you through this, what we call technical decon. And, and this is where we are able to um, thoroughly decon uh, you as a patient, uh, us as responders, um, and, and so forth, so that you come out the other side of this um, clean and, and able to be uh, sent on for further care. All right, I mentioned our fire boats, but uh, this is really uh, a capability that is an extension of our land-based um, response into the Puget Sound. Um, you can see some of the, cap the uh, capabilities there, but they're, they're used not only for fire suppression, uh, but, but for search and rescue out on the, the open water. Um, the, the fire boats uh, here in Elliott Bay would serve uh, in the events of a, a large scale uh, earthquake um, where possibly the infrastructure below ground, the, uh, the um, uh, water that's pumping to the fire hydrants may be compromised. We've got the ability to use these as a manifold basically and pull water out of the Puget Sound uh, coupled with those hose wagons we just talked about that have approximately a mile worth of hose on them each and, and run that water uh, from that water source up into um, the inland, uh, you know, upwards of a mile or so in order to get a water supply for fire suppression. Uh, this, this was, um, this topic was really enhanced recently. We partnered with the uh, Princeton University uh, and, and uh, University of Buffalo, New York. They did a, a very detailed study of, of a, a portion of downtown Seattle and they looked at following a large scale earthquake like we're talking about, what kind of fires might we expect to see uh, that would ignite after the shaking stops. And um, after running through many models, uh, they, they, they noted that we need to be prepared 
to put out fires uh, with the compromised water supply system uh, down in the uh, in the Pioneer Square or the downtown core. Uh, so so coupling our fire boats with with those hose wagons we talked about, um, that's part of our response plan. Rescue swimmers, uh, they are, are dispersed throughout the community. Uh, this is an open water um, uh, resource uh, for, for lakes, for, for the, the Puget Sound as well. Uh, surface diving down to 20 feet uh, to, to make um, a, a rapid save of somebody and before they drown. The Marine and Tunnel team uh, is, is a unique team, and, and this is a team that is uh, equipped and trained to facilitate firefighting on board uh, vessels, uh, large ships. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of um, traffic, uh, mar maritime traffic that comes through the Port of Seattle. And often we are called upon to uh, help mitigate situations there. Um, and I, I threw this one in because I would challenge you to find any other department that has one of these. Um, we This is our mobile ventilation unit. And I, and I bring this because I, I really feel like it in, it, it emphasizes the fact that um, we're unique in Seattle. Uh, we, we, we have a MVU, as we call it, um, that can change the environment of the incident. And now that may be in a, in a firefight, uh, that might be pressurizing a stairwell and a high rise in order to create a safe space for uh, members to descend the stairwell and not be in the smoke. Uh, that might be pumping fresh air into a tunnel environment uh, or a collapsed structure, uh, as well as in a hazmat. Uh, we, we can actually move the, uh, the a cloud uh, in a direction to create a safe space uh, for us to operate in and, and for the public to um, to be safe. Our vault team, many of you may know, is a uh, just a tremendous successful partnership with City Light. Uh, this this was born out of uh, some incidents that uh, highlighted that water is not the most effective means of mitigating fire, and especially here in Seattle, with uh, we have such a large um, tech industry. Um, uh, Increased damage or or delays due to fire can have a uh, catastrophic event or, or uh, effect on tech business. So, uh, in summary, this team is partnering with City Light to to be equipped with the proper tools, the CO2 to put those type of fires out uh, and do it safely, both for the public as well as our members. So they're on call 24 hours a day. Our communications team. Uh, we've talked about the fact that we have a. 24 7 911 dispatch center, uh, but that's not it. Uh, we have uh, a robust um, cache of, of radios, uh, equipments uh, that we can push out into uh, into rural areas. Um, we can we can set up a, a um, communications network here in Seattle if ours were to go down. Um, but we don't just have equipment. We have trained communication leaders and communication technicians that are able to operate those. Uh, and I can tell you that this gets used regularly. We've already had our first deployment to the wildland uh, firefighting scene uh, of a, a com T uh, with equipment in order to support those efforts uh, in, the, in the wildland arena. And then lastly, I would just uh, highlight that we have, while we don't have our own aviation platforms, uh, we do have members that are trained and equipped to operate in and around aircraft. Uh, as you can see in some of these photos, uh, we have folks that can communicate with the aircraft from the ground. And this is going to be important because uh, in the event of an earthquake where the road structure may be out or compromised, we may be looking for, um, for airlift, uh, uh, some sort of rotary wing uh, to come in to resupply uh, or, or or help extract people. Uh, but our, our members are ready to set up landing zones or pickup zones, um, ride the hoist if they need to. And this team was deployed to the uh, OSO landslides uh, several years ago and, and did just that. So they're, they're trained and ready. All right, now that you have a snapshot of, of kind of who we are and some of the capabilities we bring, I want to shift into the, the next topic of disaster management. So um, our, our disaster management, um, which we refer to as the orange book, is really a body of uh, policies and administrative decisions and, and operational activities that are, are in place to both prepare, respond to, and then recover from uh, natural 
or man-made disasters. Uh, so this orange book comes in four versions and, and it's it's tailored to a field version. So we have one on every apparatus. Uh, we have a, a station version in every fire station. Each battalion headquarters has a version that, that applies to operations at their level. And then the resource management center, or what we call the RMC, many uh, other departments call this their uh, department operations center, uh, their, their doc. Uh, also has a copy. So that's in uh, this this set of guidelines is really in place um, to guide operational direction in the field. Uh, these, this, this lets our members have a framework to, to not just guess, but to know what to be doing when this happens. Uh, it also gives guidance to our fire alarm center on, on what protocols need to be put in place. Um, and uh, and then at the emergency, the RMC or the, the EOC, it shares our plan um, of what other departments can expect. Oh, just a moment. What I want to do is, there we go. Let's, let's uh, I think it's important for you to know um, how we operate. Uh, the, the Seattle Fire Department for, uh, really transparently uh, is always at a level five. Um, and so level five is is an implement is is the first implementation level of this disaster management plan. Um, and that's really day to day operations. Uh, that is that's what we talked about at the beginning of this. Your level of expectation is that you call 911 and we respond uh, and, and we we are responding to uh, hundreds of calls every single day and we're able to manage that with the resources that we have. Uh, this this structure that we have uh, descending from from five down to level one really is built in um, in progression of logistical support and coordination needs in order to maintain capabilities in the city. Uh, and, and it's also like I mentioned a minute ago, this is built on an all hazard uh, approach, um, but I will tell you that these five uh, levels are not correspondent to what some of you may be familiar with in our levels of, uh, of alarms, and we'll, we'll talk about those. Um, so level five, day-to-day -day ops. Uh, level four is, um, well, actually, before I leave that, uh, the, the, the only uh, chain, um, maybe uh, shift from day-to-day -day ops uh, would be in level five we may stand up our resource management center staff it with command and staff personnel uh, during level five when we have pre-planned events and that might be something like seafare so this is something that we've developed an event action plan we've, we've got a detailed plan for we know that it's going to require um, some additional logistics and so forth but it's it's an it's an it's a um, isolated incident that's happening parallel with daily ops. Uh, so as we as we leave level four, or excuse me, level five, we move into level four. This is where the department's going to have uh, really minor impacts to the citywide coverage, um, and that's due to events such as say uh, New Year's Eve, Fourth uh, of July, um, where we anticipate multiple calls. Uh, this is taxing the nine nine one one system and our resources uh, to a degree. Not broken, but but just taxing it. Um, and this is also during say two and three alarm fire situations where we've we've deployed resources um, uh, simultaneously operating throughout the city and we're, we've, we're beginning to be depleted. Um, so we've got multiple separate incidents that are, are ongoing. Um, the, the control phase, what we would call for an incident like this is still in one operational period so we're not we're not necessarily doing callbacks yet we we may for certain individuals uh, or certain units but but it's really um still isolated to to one period of time and that's a 24-hour shift um uh in level four uh if depending on how taxed we are uh, the fire alarm center may choose to to uh, reduce automatic fire alarm responses or what we call afas to a single unit. Uh, typically, that's going to get uh, we get a, a, a truck, two engines, and a battalion chief. Um, but but just for um, resource management, we may go down to a single unit. Uh, aid units are typically going to be left off of fire responses uh, in order to create more coverage for for um, EMS runs. Um, and we'll, we'll be evaluating if there are any callback needs. Um, now, as we descend into level three, uh, this is where citywide coverage um, and our response capacity is, is what I would call severely limited. Uh, this is going to be uh, for 
and or five alarm fire. Uh, we've thrown a lot of resources at this uh, and, and we the pool is is shallow to, to pull from at this point. Um, it's going to have um, uh, citywide impacts. Um, and these are incidents such as like a like a citywide snowstorm, uh, citywide uh, uh, wind or windstorm or a power outage, uh, as well as um, possibly uh, an earthquake. Now, now an earthquake, as we all know on this call, can have, can range in in magnitude and and severity. But but this is where we're starting to see hey the ground's been shaken. We we may find ourselves pushing out resources into this level three. Um, uh, fire responses may be reduced in size uh, and we may have to we have code red and code yellow responses based on dispatches uh, categorization of the severity and we may have to triage that and make code yellow responses uh, discretionary uh, at, at um, the FAC's level. So th this is where we're starting to get into that expectation management. Um, just know that as, as there's less of us to go around, um, we have to make these tough decisions. Um, the Resource Management Center is, is very likely staffed at this point. It will be staffed with command and, and staff, uh, and we are um, uh, we may be looking at extending our response into the next shift. So this is, for those of you familiar with an incident action plan, this is where we start documenting and building that plan because we, we expect whatever's happening to carry on for multiple um, work periods uh, and, and there needs to be continuity and documentation and, and hand off of the plan. Uh, we would also in a level three expect for the EOC to be activating, uh, which means we would be represented there as well. Um, OK, so level two, as things continue to get worse, um, this is catastrophic. Uh, this is this is something like uh, a severe earthquake, uh, possibly a pandemic, although I will tell you uh, we did not go to a level two in in um, in the COVID response, um, but this is where most calls are only going to get one unit um, and and that's that's really to spread the resources, uh, but but um, uh, it gives the FAC discretion over where where the best use of dispatched units uh, is. Uh, we're going to be looking to mutual aid at this point. Now, one thing to keep in mind for us and for you is that as we are experiencing a catastrophic event in Seattle, it's very likely that that's a regional event. And so many of our mutual aid partners, uh, be it Bellevue or Shoreline or Tukwila, are, are likely dealing with similar situations themselves. So mutual aid uh, in and of itself is not, uh, the Calvary isn't necessarily coming right away. Um, this is the first plug I'm gonna make for, um, for community preparedness, for preparedness on your end, because when we get into this level, um, the, the, the biggest force more multiplier that, that you can be is, is being self-sustained and self-sufficient uh, through your preparation and, and your planning. Um, we talked about some mutual aid uh, and we'll go into detail uh, a little bit more in a second, but that those, that can come from a, uh, a tiered response. And so that, that could be local mutual aid, that could be state, or that could even go out as far as federal. Um, and, uh, and we could be, uh, we would likely be looking to call back resources at this point to upstaff um, and, uh, and the fire department ourselves are gonna be in a position where we we are expecting to be on our own, even at the fire stations uh, for 24 to 72 hours, if not longer on our own. So we, we just like I'm asking you, are gonna need to be self-sustained um, ourselves. Now, the only difference uh, really between level two and level one is that uh, same conditions, it's just that the fire alarm center is not operational. Uh, and now, maybe that's because um, of the, um, uh, they've experienced uh, damage, uh, maybe maybe the, the the towers are out or something is precluding them or whatever the reason, uh, we've lost communications. Now, uh, any day-to-day -day operations uh, is like up in level five, run through the fire alarm center. That's our central point of dispatching. They speak with the authority of the fire chief and, and they're the ones that make the calls. In level one, when they are not in the picture, uh, we break off and start to execute decentralized uh, operations and decentralized dispatching. And that's, uh, recall back to the map that I showed you at the beginning, um, that's where our five battalions, in essence, become their own geographic fire departments. And, and the battalion chief in those that battalion is managing the, the, the units and the resources 
um, independently. Although, as we will talk about, that information will continue to flow to a central point uh, to create common operating picture uh, at both the department wide and citywide level. A um, couple notes, uh, level three, two and one. Um, these these uh, are certain response assets. They may just may not be available uh, and that, that includes our limited quantities of battalion chiefs, our limited quantities of aid and medic units, uh, those those technical teams that I briefed you on here at the beginning of this. Uh, Rescue one, there's not going to be enough of them to go around. So so we are operating with um, the basic four man, uh, four person fire engine or, or ladder truck um, out there to, to make and respond, make decisions and respond on their own. And then um, and just to give you kind of the mindset that we are in at this point at the fire department, the highest priority as we get into level two and level one uh, is really going to be immediate life safety actions and as well as defensive operations uh, in order to just contain and keep whatever's happening from getting worse. Whether that's a fire, uh, you know, it may not be an offensive attack. This is this is just how, how do we how do we stop uh, the damage and begin to um, uh, get our arms around it. OK, so what I want to do is to walk you through a scenario uh, of, of what we would be doing at the fire department level during an earthquake. Um, we drill on this every year. Uh, in the fall, we, we run a, a citywide earthquake drill. So this is something we take very seriously and we're constantly refining our plans. Um, but but I'm going to walk you through this slide. Um, this really speaks to the communications. Uh, so this the slide that you're looking at right now, you can see the the, the stakeholders in this this scheme. Um, you see the the FAC and D1 up there is Deputy One, so that that represents kind of higher headquarters. Um, and then you've got uh, the five different battalions. You see six battalions on there with Battalion Three, uh, but. Uh, the five geographic battalions with their subsequent stations down below. And we're just going to use Battalion 2 as an example. So the first thing we do is, is there's communication between the FAC and Deputy 1 identifying, is the FAC operational? Are we in a level 1 or are we in level 2? And that, that's going to dictate what happens next. We train for level 1. Uh, immediately, uh, our members know because they have those orange books we talked about uh, with checklists. They're going to be doing a self-assessment of their own stations. Is there damage to the station? Can we get the apparatus doors open to get the apparatus out to respond? Um, and, and that's actually one of the things to do is immediately pull them out uh, so that uh, we don't have to worry about uh, having them trapped inside. Um, what's the state of our personnel? Is anyone injured? Uh, so so we, we are taking inventory on, on what our capabilities and, and the status of our people are. Once we get that, uh, the at the station level, that, that battalion chief is is making calls to each station to get an update so that he or she has um, a firm understanding of what capabilities exist in their own battalion. Now, I'll just remind you, we're just using battalion two, but this is happening simultaneously throughout all five battalions in the city. OK, once that foundation has been done, um, each station is going to go out and conduct a, uh, a route recon or many people here, uh, the, the damage assessment or the windshield surveys. Uh, this is the plan uh, that the fire department will execute, uh, but this plan is nested in the city's plans. Uh, we, because of our location throughout the city and the apparatus that we have, the members that we have, we are the initial eyes of the city, of, of the EOC, of the mayor, uh, to just assess how bad the damage is and where the where the focal points are. Uh, so they go out, they complete these, uh, and, and as they're going, they're taking note. Uh, the officer on each of those apparatus is taking note of, of what they're seeing and documenting that, and they are they're categorizing it, and they are pushing or actually uh, sending that information to the battalion chiefs so that in one central point uh, they're getting an assessment of the whole city. Uh, so once that happens, the battalion chiefs uh, collect all, all of that information, uh, prioritize it amongst their battalion, um, and then they begin to uh, push that information to the RMC so that our, our RMC now sees citywide what our firefighters on the ground are seeing. And then uh, 
they are able to uh, push resources internally uh, as needed to begin mitigating. And then that RMC will, on that communication cycle, push the information to the EOC. That was an overview of what happens uh, at, at the uh, the battalion law or the uh, just overview of the whole thing company operations we'll just quickly go through this um we spoke a little bit about this but i want you to pay attention to the graphic here um i'll, I'll go ahead and build the slide um each of your each of the battalion correction each um response district for each fire station has a earthquake route and this earthquake route is designed uh, intentionally to uh, let the units drive in one continuous swoop and put eyes on key infrastructure, uh, key locations that are places of high life safety, possibly um, um, uh, um, um, a hospital, um, a, a large uh, location where folks may be working. Now, some of this may depend on the day and of uh, the week and the time of day that this happens, uh, but a, a school, for instance, uh, uh, a place of worship. Uh, these are places we want to know. Um, we anticipate seeing if there's damage, the most um, hazard and the most li lives may be uh, at stake. So th this is a pictorial um, representation of what that route looks like. This is just a quickly a what that documentation looks like. So that person, that, that officer in the front seat is filling this out and, and giving it uh, a number so that in the event, and, and I need to pause here for a second and again, really just address expectation management. Uh, during the, the earthquake route that you're looking at, uh, you very well may see a fire apparatus drive by your incident. Uh, now we go back to the mission statement that we started with, and that that is a, a stark deviation from what you're used to seeing uh, in the Seattle Fire Department. We we come to you whenever you need help. In an instant like this, we may drive by because it is it is critical for us to get a comprehensive view of the entire city uh, so that we can make uh, decisions on where resources should be prioritized and, and that if we can affect an immediate uh, rescue or or maybe throw some some uh, supplies to you and, and say hey we will be back um, we will but uh, just take comfort in knowing that through this this process here this card that you're looking at you are, your incident is known. It is documented, it is pushed up, and help help will be on the way. All right, we're quickly going to kind of see a graphic of what this battalion uh, operation looks like. So, so you, 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 you've got a visual for what's happening at all the companies, and they're pushing that, all that information up to the first funnel point. Uh, so you can see that uh, this, this person, um, these two people that are housed at this fire station, they break up into this team with dedicated assignments. Uh, you've got folks on the radio that are responsible for, for receiving that information. Uh, and then somebody takes it, scribes it at this level. Uh, we, we work and we train in an analog process. Uh, digital is great as long as it's working. So very literally, we are prepared uh, in the event everything goes down to continue operations. Uh, so we've got folks scribing with a pen and paper to put these cards together. Uh, that scribe then sends that information over to uh, a, 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 um, a map manager. Uh, typically, this is a driver, uh, somebody who's very intimate with uh, the battalion, the roads, the, the neighborhoods, and they're, they're pictorially marking this on a map where the incidents are located. So that, that just get a picture worth a thousand words and that gives the incident, the uh, battalion manager, uh, battalion chief, a visual on where the damage, where the heart of the damage may be in their battalion and they can make decisions accordingly. So once that gets um, marked on the map, uh, that information goes over to the uh, the FIT. Uh, FIT is an acronym, Field Incident Technician. Technician, excuse me. That that FIT is basically the right hand person for that uh, battalion chief, so that they can be making decisions. And, and this FIT is taking that and they're putting it on a board at the direction of the battalion chief and, and the experience that that typically 15 to 20 year uh, uh, chief has. Um, they're making some of those hard decisions, some of those first judgment calls of what is what is level one, two, and three? What can we handle with the resources we have within our own battalion? Um, what can what are we going to need outside battalion resources to help? Or what are we going to need bigger than our battalion uh, and so forth? So this is all a uh, an act of triage. 
Uh, and then all of this information gets pushed up to the EOC when they're called upon uh, and, and for to, to make uh, um, again in the theme of triage, typically the top five incidents at this level are the ones that get pushed up and then this this cycle goes over and over and over. And so if you're incident number six, that doesn't mean we won't get to you, but we're feeding the top incidents first and then we'll come back for the for the what we consider the next uh, the next five and the next five and the next five. All right, so quickly, where does that information go at the at the RMC? Because we're continuing to just push this up and great, get uh, greater situational awareness. Very similar process happens. This is a picture of inside our, our resource management center. This is staffed with uh, command and staff uh, leadership um, that, that are able to make area area command decisions. Um, they've got battalion maps of the entire city there, and they're doing a very similar process. So assigned positions, uh, you, I basically just talked to you about what some of these uh, individuals are doing. Um, uh, that re RMC manager is the person that is coordinating with the EOC. Um, uh, you've got liaisons, you've got the scribes that are documenting, uh, the map manager, same function. Uh, we have a fit in the RMC as well. And then um, that EOC liaison, uh, is the person that, uh, that that manages that relationship um, and um, making sure that this is clearly communicated to the EOC so that it can be integrated into the larger response and also give uh, uh, EOC and, and the mayor uh, accurate information. All right. Uh, one quick slide just to show you because I think it's important for you to know that all of this is done in a in a rhythm um, and it's it's uh, based on these communication cycles. Uh, the the mayor gets a brief uh, and there are reports report outs at the EOC that all of the departments Seattle Fire you're hearing about tonight, but all these other departments are doing similar activities need to feed accurate and timely information up to you. So we are we are back planning all of our communication cycles in order to meet these timelines uh, so that so that the EOC um, is getting briefed on the uh, uh, at, at the accurate time. So that's with a busy picture, but if you took the time to look at it, you'll see how that how that breaks down to make that achievable. OK, so we've talked about who we are. We've talked about what the uh, some of our uh, internal plans are. We've talked about uh, the nuts and bolts of what we are doing uh, once the ground stops shaking. Uh, and now I'd like to just shift into um, uh, the beginning of, of our multiple alarm response and and talk a little bit more about what do we do when Seattle fires robust as we are just isn't enough uh, and we need help. So. Um, Typical fire response uh, would be a uh, sense with four engines, two trucks, and a complement of support staff. Um, as the fire is larger in size and that, and um, we need to put more units towards it, we will up it. And this is this breakdown right here shows you what that looks like. So, um, uh, 211, 311, 411. 511 and then a general fire alarm and that's when we're throwing everything we have at it uh, and you can you can see how they incrementally grow there uh, and I want to just show th this happens this happens on a, um, a routine basis not not frequently but I mean it's not uncommon to see a four alarm fire in normal daily operations so I, I want to set that expectation with you that that there are times we don't have to wait for an earthquake for the Seattle Fire Department to be um, depleting our resources in order to manage uh, incidents. Now I'm going to give this is an example. Uh, this is this is a snapshot of a multiple alarm response. This was a 411 fire, a four alarm fire um, back in 2018. Uh, and as you can see, uh, that ticker down there at the bottom shows you there's a lot of units assigned to this this one single incident, this was not even an earthquake. So you can see all the committed SFD resources at that time. So it is not out, um, it's not far fetched to, to, this kind of puts in perspective that if we have a significant earthquake, terrorist event or so forth, uh, we are gonna be leaning on this process we're about to talk about, about asking for outside resources. All right, so what do we do? What's that look like when we need, we need help? So, I uh, mentioned a minute ago, there's kind of uh, uh, rings or incremental 
responses to that. Um, that local would be considered mutual or automatic aid. Uh, and we do this, we support um, others and others support us on a regular basis. We will send units across the border over into Shoreline uh, or folks may come down into Seattle. Now, I, I will tell you, um, we are fortunate. You are fortunate because your fire department has a lot of capabilities uh, and, and we are able to handle the majority of calls uh, day in and day out, regardless of size um, or, or characteristic internally. So this is something that we're planning for and, and we're familiar with the process, but but you don't see units from other departments in the city limits very frequently. Um, that's not the same in other parts of the county um, where they just don't have as many resources. They, they cross borders frequently um, and, and, and do automatic aid in order to make sure that, that they have adequate responses. Um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen here. The photo you're looking at right there uh, is the back of Seattle Fire Station 14. And this was uh, just a few, well, about a year ago, excuse me, uh, during the uh, Capitol Hill um, organized protest. And, and that's where we said, you know what, we may need more. And we, we made the calls and, and we staged some, some extra vehicles. So you can see other units came in to, to do that. So after that local level, uh, which may or may not be available because they may be dealing with their own, uh, we've got the regional level. And that's, that's things like state mobilizations, uh, emergency um, management uh, compacts, and, and then even that next concentric circle out is at the national level. Now the implied the implied deal here is though that the further out there they're coming from, the longer it takes. And and when time is not on our side in these type of responses. Uh, so again, this is this is the second time you'll hear me say we it is critical. You are critical in being a part of making this a successful uh, response and and being prepared having a plan um, and being able to take care of yourself and your neighbors and your communities. Um, I, what I want to show you next um, is, a, is a quick video. Uh, the, the greater, what we call the Greater Seattle Urban Area Security Initiative or, or the UASI region, and the UASI region is, is uh, made up of um, uh, Snohomish, Pierce, King counties, uh, city of Bellevue, and the city of Seattle. And, and we've been preparing for this type of regional uh, response for, for years. Really, since 2005, we've been running a, a, a program to train first responders on with the skills that they need, the technical skills they need to perform those structural collapse rescues, um, those life-saving rescues. Um, it's estimated that a, that a magnitude 9.0 or something similar like that or, or a terrorist event in the in the region is going to require upwards of 3000 trained responders uh, that, that have the technical training, the technical equipment to to perform the level of um, life saving rescues that that we anticipate and that we've been talking about tonight. Um, and it's through this program that we've been continually training and, and building that cadre throughout the region uh, for this type of incident specifically. Right now, we've got a, roughly 700 people trained. So again, we're not there yet, we're working on it, uh, but you uh, can be a part of, of that effort uh, by being prepared in your own communities. Um, so this, this video not only shows um, what that training consists of, but it really emphasizes uh, the need of communities uh, to be self-sufficient to make this make this work. So it's uh, four or five minutes, I wanna show it to you, and then we'll, we'll um, proceed with the presentation.
Apologies, everybody. It looks like our um, audio is not working for this this video. Andy, I don't know if you want to try to restart it um, or maybe we'll just press forward if we're not able to get the audio working. Apologies again. Yeah, let me try one more time, Carrie. I'm sorry about that. Um, no problem. That's what that's what happens, you know. <laughs> Best did you catch any of the audio? No, it's oh, not. Rats. OK, we'll give it one more shot. If not, um, it's a uh, it's a great representation and folks can contact me if they'd like to see it. Yeah, and we just a reminder, we will be sending out the um, the presentation, I believe, so people can take a look at it. If, if you have it available, we can always do it that way as well. Andy, you might need to unshare and then when you reshare, there's a little box to select include audio. Are you getting audio now or not? No, no audio. OK, I'm going to do one one troubleshoot, but I want to respect people's time tonight uh, and and we will drive on if we if we need to. So give me a second. Enormous amount of risk out there. I think it, what I went through and looked historically. You hear that? It's not a matter of Great. if it's going to happen. It's a matter of when it's going to happen. We're looking here at training our local firefighters Still originally good? to be able to engage in that first 24 hours with the knowledge and the tools to be able to be successful. There has been a massive explosion at a federal building in Oklahoma the City. The federal Oklahoma. building has been blown off, Jesse. About a, about a third. About a third yeah. building. Oh, my God. See at least 20 cars under the bridge. You don't even see the tires. Multiple calls reporting a crane falling from the roof onto multiple cars. Emergencies, emergencies, emergencies. We are on the ground. We are Oh, my God. Now. We don't know whether this is the result of a bomb. But we're looking at a uh, live picture from Washington, and there is smoke pouring out of the Pentagon. Continuing live coverage of the wow. apparent terrorist attacks today here in New York City and in Washington, D.C. It's important to say these things at the very beginning. There is much that is not known about what is happening. The second thing is that the word from almost everybody who's trying to deal with the situation, the word of the day is steady, steady. This class is way more than a class. This isn't just a certificate, it's a capability. And in some ways, it's a capability that's not just specific to their jurisdiction, it's they can call on the jurisdictions that's around them and even further out to the regional partners to support this. When we first started out, we really thought we kind of had it all figured out. And uh, like anything else, the more you learn, the less you realize you know, uh, the longer you do this. And, you know, what we've evolved to today is light years ahead of, uh, of where we were when we began. The class in total is an 80 hour course, 30 of which are actually spent doing some pre-study material and then 50 hours, which is five 10 hour days, very long physical days, are spent doing the hands-on portion uh, of the class. Uh, we hit the ground moving pretty quickly though, picking up some, you know, uh, lots of heavy loads, odd shaped loads. We truly try to challenge them. We know they've lifted pieces of concrete up before. We know they've used airbags before. We try to really challenge them and show them um, unique ways to, to lift a piece of equipment or use equipment they've ne maybe never been exposed to before. Tuesday is all about shoring, emergency building shores. So Monday is pretty much cribbing heavy, but uh, Tuesday they actually learn how to construct both uh, prefab aluminum shoring and wood shoring that they can leave in place later. Um, Wednesday is breaching, breaking, and burning day where they'd be exposed to three different technologies for cutting steel, the petrogen, the oxyacetylene uh, torch, and the exothermic torch. 
In addition to that, half the day is spent bre breaching and breaking concrete. The different ways to do clean and dirty breaches horizontally, vertically, up, down, and all ways. So uh, they have a pretty good uh, basis for both pneumatic, hydraulic, and manual tools for uh, breaking uh, concrete. Thursday is rigging day. And I think that's one of the classes that sets us apart from what you might get exposed at a heavy rescue class, or rescue system two classes. We're really um, heavy into the hand rigging and how to move, move loads inside a structure. Uh, so they have the cranes part of the day, but the majority of the day is spent building artificial high directionals, A-frames, gin poles, those kind of things, and then drifting loads using lever hoists or come-alongs and uh, grip hoists and those kinds of things where they really can apply those skills if they don't have access to a crane, if they, they have access to these, these pieces of equipment that are available at any rental yard or any Home Depot or any hardware store, they're able to use those things. Because let's face facts, when the when the big one hits, whether it's man-made or, or a natural disaster, we're never going to have all the equipment that we want or we need. So we have to be pretty innovative in how we can solve problems before the Calvary gets here, which may be a week or more before we actually get all the resources that we need and will people survive that long. So how can we maximize uh, the efforts that we're going to be able to bring to bear early on? Okay. All right, we should be looking at the outside resources slide. Um, that uh, the video we just saw showed, I think, uh, have confidence that, that your your responders, uh, not only in the Seattle Fire Department, but throughout the region are getting trained on in the skills, the technical skills they need um, to come, to come get you. So, so when, when we need more, this is what it looks like. Um, th there's a flow to it, there's a process in place. Um, it starts at the on scene, the incident commander there, and, and then we push those resource requests very similar through the process we just talked about up to our local um, RMC who then feeds that to the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center at the city, and then they have tentacles to go out uh, to, to what you can see those different channels there to, um, to acquire that assistance. Um, some of these things, the Emergency Management Assistance Compact or the the EMAC, um, that, that's going to provide uh, assistance during governor declared state emergencies or, or disasters. Um, and these are systems that allow states to send personnel and equipment and commodities uh, to assist with the response and the recovery efforts um, outside of their state. So, so others may be coming in. And then um, the PNEMA, it's the Pacific Northwest Emergency Management Agreement, uh, very similar to the EMAC, but, but that's a specific membership. So, so here in the Northwest, that's Washington, Idaho, Oregon, Alaska, British Columbia, and the Yukon. Um, so one, one thing just to note, um, I mentioned a minute earlier when we were talking about communications, I, gave you, I told you that some of our members have deployed to support wildland firefighting and uh, uh, wildland firefighting does this really well. They, they've got processes in place to request additional resources uh, and, and build up capabilities where they need them and, and uh, do mobilizations. And so we, we have that channel as well as in the fire service uh, through the uh, fire service resource resource mobilization plan. Um, so, and really, when it comes down to, it, that's really based on on a lot of relationships and and maintaining those and being able for the the local fire chief when they've depleted or are close to depleting their resources and their mutual aid efforts to call and and start that line that effort going as well. So. Um, that gives you an idea. Uh, in this process, things are categorized, and we the opening slide showed you that I'm presenting on ESF 4, 9, and 10, firefighting, search and rescue, and hazmat, uh, but all the other needs that go into response are also categorized, and that's, that's where the EOC is beginning to uh, put order to these different requests in order to fulfill them. And then I want to show uh, uh, this slide real quick. So this is, uh, this is the, the FEMA urban search and rescue network. There's 28 teams out there across the country and up in Washington, we have one of those, uh, Washington Task Force One. Uh, and very similar to what I talked about a minute ago, if the earth's shaking here in the Northwest, 
we're not going to Washington Task Force One isn't coming to help. It, it's probably it may not even be coming from California. Uh, we Washington Task Force One has responded all the way down to Georgia before, uh, but with that takes time. And there, there's a, a very um, detailed method for mobilizations that you don't need to be worried about. But but it calls upon uh, assets that are outside of the of the area of um, needing the most need and, and then whether they fly or they drive uh, is really going to take time and that's why it's it's imperative that, that you all um, are prepared to conduct your own rescues or just impact um, the, the rescue. Uh, I've seen statistics that show that the most rescues and life-saving efforts are really going to be by those that are next nearby. That's you, your neighbor, that, that have a long bar, a shovel, a set of work gloves that can just leverage something and grab somebody. Um, because the longer it goes, uh, you know, science shows the longer your body goes uh, with, with potential medical uh, injuries and lack of water and food, um, the less the chances of survival end up being. So these teams are coming with a lot of technical, technically trained individuals and a, a lot of excellent equipment, but it just takes time. So this is where we're going to we're going to land and is in that area of public preparedness. Um, so I, I know that uh, the last month's um, uh, webinar spoke to some of this, but but really it comes down to taking ownership in, in being ready for yourself, for your neighborhood, for your community, um, being self-sufficient. So and there, there are lots of resources that the City of Seattle and the EOC has to help guide you through this process. Uh, and so I, Seattle Fire Department highly encourages you to, to do that. Um, anticipate what you're going to need uh, and, and prepare that ahead of time. Some of the, the trainings that are offered here in the city that we would encourage you to take are, are listed there. Um, Get yourself first aid trained. Uh, get your neighbor first aid trained. Go take a CPR class. Um, the Stop the, the Bleed class uh, gives you the skills and the equipment to do that. And then uh, one, one program that we hope to pick back up post COVID is the basic search and rescue training uh, to give you some of the fundamentals uh, that you can do to save people's lives. Um, but this really comes down to managing those expectations. Uh, like I've, I've said a few times now, we, we will not be there as quickly as we are uh, in a day-to-day -day response. And then uh, this, uh, many of you are familiar with this website uh, up there in the upper right corner is, is where you can find this, this information, but I would really point you towards the EOC. Um, amazing, just a, a one lo location for, for so many resources um, and familiarize yourself. I would imagine that most of you on this call uh, or on this, this webinar tonight are, are familiar with the hub system. Um, get involved, uh, help other people start a hub. Um, you know, we're showing that there's over 135 right now here in the city, so that's, that's outstanding. But, um, uh, you know, embrace that, own it, build it up uh, so that when the time comes, you're ready. Um, Seattle Fire Department also embraces the hub concept. I, I, um, folks like like Cindy Barker over in West Seattle, uh, we talk uh, and she, uh, are, are integrating our plans together. Uh, last year we, we included them, uh, the hubs and uh, the ACN, the communications folks, into our earthquake plan because we know uh, we will not be alone and we need you to be a part of this response. Um, with that, um, th we've talked about these things. Uh, this is where we started, um, and this is where I'd like to, to end before we go into questions. Um, but but you can you know a little bit more about us now. You know what our plans are. You know what our initial actions are as soon as the the ground stops shaking. We talked about what that looks like to request help when we are not enough, and then we we've. Um, We've provided you with some suggestions on how you can equip yourself and your community to be ready. Uh, this webinar tonight is going to be followed by another one in July. Uh, you can see the schedule there. I really encourage you to continue to tune into these. Uh, it's a great effort that the EOC is doing to, to take this and take ownership in, in this as a city in preparing for an earthquake, a large disaster, um, and so forth. So um, with that, um, I would love to take your questions. Thank you so much, Andy.
Um, and thank you for all of you for listening in. I think we'll start in on some of the Q&A questions that we have. Um, Neil would like to thank you so much for your presentation and everything that SFD does every day. Um, his question was relating to how much energy do you store a, a way to keep going? I, for example, fuel, food, and water for operations. Second part is that is do the fire stations have backup power generators, food, and potable water? Neil, that's a that's a great question because we need to practice what we preach, right? Um, so the fire departments do have generators. We uh, each each station does have a generator, uh, and when that is on a, a routine uh, check to make sure that's operational, um, and and it's getting most uh, most stations have. A, uh, a fuel source there. Um, the exact gallonage of the tank, I don't know off the top of my head, I can get that information for you, but it's uh, it's large. I mean, upwards of, uh, I don't think I'm, at, I'm exaggerating if I was to say, you know, a, a thousand gallons uh, or more. And and so um, we do we do keep the, the fuel on hand in order to both fuel our rigs um, manually if needed with a hand pump uh, or um, use that to fuel the generator to keep the station going. Um, your, your questions about uh, food and water in the stations, uh, we do have uh, on every six months uh, to make it easy for us. Uh, we do it at daylight savings time. We change out the water um, that we have stored in the fire station uh, so that we have fresh water that we know that we're able to use. And, and the, the food, um, there are some, it's not uniform, but there are some rations in, in stations. Now we do as a department, have um, uh, cases of MREs, the meals ready to eat, uh, that are are able to be pushed out um, in the event of emergency, um, but we don't always keep them at each station. So that that is an area that we're continuing to assess. Um, we we try to keep them in centrally located regions, like in in dedicated stations that could then serve as a cache to push them out into their battalions. Um, but hopefully, Neil, that that answers the, the majority of your questions. Great, thank you, Captain Collins. Um, the second one is, and I'm not sure if, if you have the specific answer, but good question. What percentage of fire to firefighters live within the city of Seattle boundaries? And then the second part of that question is what will happen if highways are out and those, those firefighters cannot get to work? Right, that, that's a great question because uh, we've got all kinds of fancy equipment uh, and tools, but if we don't have the people, um that that's our primary asset um it is no surprise um the firefighters live don't all live here in seattle uh, many of them live outside the city uh, some of them even live outside the state uh and and the unique schedule that we keep the 24-hour schedule allows for that um it is it is known though uh in our orange book and in our callback plans uh, individuals are, are designated by distance that they live away from the city. Uh, and, and so that's a quick reference for the folks that are doing the, the callbacks. Um, we know that we've got a quarter of our department, a captive audience on duty at any given moment. Uh, so, so we've got them in hand. Um, but if we're looking to bring the next shift in or so forth, uh, they can do that analysis based on who's um, you know, I'll call it a tier, tier one, two, and three based on um, just distance away from the city and, and call upon those closest first uh, if, if transportation is an issue. Um, now, the, the one thing I would add to that though is that in, in the spirit of creativity, um, firefighters, I wouldn't be surprised if they find their way in one way or, or another. Um, and, and so, that's not necessarily a plan that we can bank on, but I wouldn't be surprised. But but firefighters are members of communities as well. Some of them live in Seattle, some of them don't. And if if someone lives in Tacoma and they've had an earthquake down there, just as we are asking you all as a community to be involved and be part of that response effort there, uh, those firefighters that may be geographically trapped somewhere else and live in a community somewhere else are gonna be a part of that greater response in the region just may not be in Seattle. Uh, and and the, the converse of that is uh, is true as well. There are people that live in Seattle that work for other fire departments that may, uh, you know, we're thinking outside the box here, but they may become part of our 
response because they've got the skills and, and the knowledge uh, to, to affect the, the mitigating the situation. Great, thank you, Captain Collins. Uh, another one from Neil, for a level one disaster, when you are not able to ask for resources, um, i.e. pulling, what gets automatically pushed to you in the big one? What is, and then what is SFD's push list? Hmm. Okay, uh, I, th I think I understand, Neil, what you're, what you're asking. Um, we, and in the slides, those terms pull and pushed were used. Um, just for clarification, that was used in, um, in the passing of information. Um, radio traffic can get really, really busy and convoluted. And, and we talked about how all of this needs to be built into this communications flow and this strictly time cycle uh, to make sure that adequate information is flowing up to the EOC in time. So in, instead of um, what we call stations pushing information, short of emergency traffic, firefighters injured or something of that nature, we allow the higher level, the battalion, to pull information from those units. That way they maintain positive control of the information flow and, and so forth. And so it's it's pulled from the from the companies to the battalion. The, the RMC pulls information from the battalions to the RMC. Um, but but your question is still still relevant as far as equipment and, and what kind of the default packages are. Um, we we default to those those bound the boundaries of the um, of the uh, uh, battalions, and so any given battalion is likely to have five to five to eight, maybe ten fire stations within their own battalion. So so that at any given moment, if the uh, a, a battalion chief would have five to eight or so apparatus uh, at their disposal or at their ability to resource, if that makes sense. So that's that's kind of the complement, the baseline complement they could expect to have out of the gate. Um, we we haven't necessarily developed push packages uh, like, OK, just push the button and, and launch, launch, you know, help. But but within Web EOC and within the EOC, that thought process is there. You know, we know that one USAR team from FEMA is not going to be enough. I mean, you look at the World Trade Center, that's one building that had seven, eight, nine, ten USAR teams dedicated to one building. So, I mean, if we if we open the aperture up and say, well, the whole downtown city of Seattle now looks like the World Trade Center, I mean, that's going to that's going to take all of them. So we uh, we try to front load that administratively, but but nothing is on a, a short fuse just to to call. Great, thank you, Andy. There is a question about um, being able to find and read the Orange Book. Is this accessible to the public? Um, this is a it's a document that's designed for internal use. Um, it is on every fire engine, every uh, administrative car that our vehicle that the, the fire department has has been issued one so they are they are at the ready for our members regardless of whether they're out of the station in the station or, or not but it's um, uh, these plans that the orange book itself isn't necessarily a, a um, outward facing uh, documents but the plans uh, that we just went over are nested in the EOC's plans for the fire department and for the city as a whole. And, and I, I believe those are made public. Uh, so you, I, would, I would venture that a lot of the material would, would be in those plans. It just may not be bound in say orange book on the front. Sure, and we will be sending information out after this um, webinar next week, including links to our sites with all of our um, public facing plans. Thanks so much. Another specific question for you, Captain Collins, is if the fire station doors are stuck shut after an earthquake, how do the firefighters get out to open to get the fire trucks out? <laughs> um, good question, right? Because like I said, we've got to get out. We got to we need to be part uh, out of the station. Um, <clears throat> um, how do I say this? Firefighters are um, 
persistent and and they are going to find a way. Uh, I, I guarantee whether they unscrew every bolt on that door and take it off piece by piece manually, the door is, is not going to stop us from getting out of the station. Um, short of driving through the door, last resort, uh, I, I can promise you uh, that we will we will get out of the station if it's at all possible. Um, hopefully that gives you high level of confidence. Great, thank you. Another question is if we need something after an earthquake, can we walk up to our local fire station and get help? Um, they also followed by first aid, water, food and shelter. And I would add that this um, question can be answered by, by future um, webinars, but specifically to let's say first aid or communication, um, Captain Collins. Yeah, Carrie, that, that's exactly right. Um, I just I kind of let you peek behind the curtain to see what we are going to be doing, uh, what your local firefighters are going to be doing uh, after the ground shakes, and, and they are going to be uh, immersed in that process of assessing the situation. Uh, they, you, you should be prepared that there may not be anybody at your fire station to even let you in if you come um, to, to the firehouse. Uh, that's not because we don't want to help, but it's because our the, our direction at this point in the operation is to get out and and to see. Um, now now once we return, uh, and I'll be honest, members on duty during this time should be prepared to not return. I mean they sh they very well could be operating off of that fire engine for another 24 hours, um, and and so in before they depart the station. Uh, when we move in, I didn't mention this in the presentation, but when we move into uh, level three, uh, part of that response is is putting extra equipment on the fire apparatus. Uh, I technical, but we put a hard suction on the apparatus so that we can pull water from a swimming pool. We can pull water from a lake and so forth. We put extra batteries on the fire engine. We put extra clothes. We put extra water. We put we we put it on the fire rig because when we leave, we're not expecting to come back. There's going to be plenty of work for us uh, to not return to the fire station. So um, so with that, uh, I, I would say always, I, I never want to send the message that the fire department doesn't want you to either call 911 or come knock on the door if, if you're experiencing an emergency, but but I just need to manage expectations that, that uh, it, your emergency may or may not be fielded in the same way um, as, it, as it would on a you know level one day-to-day -day operations um, so i would i really would ask that you uh, that you use a level of discretion and and self self-sufficiency to try to take care of your your needs uh through prior planning through community resources uh you know within your neighborhood and so forth uh before you you go to the fire fire department great thank you so much so i think we'll have one final question um can civilians bring and donate supplies to fire stations? And I know this was a um, hot topic during the kind of the intensity of the pandemic. Can yeah. you answer that? Yeah, um, I, if I read this right, it's it's from Neil. Neil, thank you for being so engaged tonight. Um, the um, we are not out of the throes of COVID yet. And, and if you've recently visited your, your local station, it, it probably still says that we're not doing blood pressure checks. Um, we're just, we're not as open to the community as we would like to be right now. Um, will we return to that? I, I have a high, I, I believe so, yes. Um, regarding uh, the donation of supplies uh, and so forth, it's gonna, it's going to depend, and I, I'm not I'm not punting your question, but there is a level of um, of uh, interoperability that we need to maintain, and so some supplies need to be of a um, you know, it's not because we don't we don't want the assistance or it's not a kind gesture, but but some things have to be of a certain material or a certain uh, grade and so forth to be for for the fire department to allow it. So I would I would say this. Um, if you want or if you feel like that's something you want to explore once we get through covid the doors open up again um stop by and, and just have a conversation with with the uh the crew that's on duty let them know what you have uh, and they'll be able to give you an honest answer on uh, whether or not the fire department is the best place for that 
or, or maybe that's something that the, your local hub would benefit from um, or, or another community group um, so that overall you're, you're benefiting the, the regional response. Uh, it just it may not land at the fire station. Great. So it looks like that is the end of our questions in the Q&A. Um, I want to thank you so much, uh, Captain Andy Collins, and all of you that attended tonight. We will get back to you. Um, those that provided an email will get a link to our recorded video on our YouTube page, as well as any other information um, we can provide either from Seattle Fire Department or from emergency management directly. And if there are questions that we weren't able to answer tonight, we will get back to you within a week or so. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And remember to join us for future webinars um, for other departments sharing how they respond to disasters. Be safe and take care. Thank you.